and we'll go right right into it. I know it's been a long morning and a good part of the afternoon we're already spent. Assemblyman Chiusano, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and, and the rest of your team. Um, I'm going to start off with just a couple of questions. Just to clarify, I'm understanding a couple things, particularly as it comes uh, as it relates to the attendance format that we're using for formula. And I thought I heard you say earlier this morning, I think when you were speaking to the chairman, now I'm not sure if it was about his district, but did you say some districts have 99% and 100% attendance? Thank you. Then we got it. Okay. The way the way the way, the way we designed it, we wanted to measure uh, attendance against a realistic standard, um, and we um, assumed, I think, consistent with uh, sound logic, that 100% um, uh, attendance was not a realistic um, ob obje ob objective. And so we looked at the attendance levels in all districts across the state and found that the, um, uh, the typical district, uh, that, that if you go this, in the 75th percentile of performance, are at 96 percent uh, attendance. So the math here gets a little bit tricky. But, but we basically calculated 100 percent for purposes of full funding at 96 percent attendance. So when I said before okay. that most of your districts are 100 percent or 99.9 percent, what that really means is they are at 96 percent or the equivalent of a 96 percent. All right, I, just, I want to make sure because I yeah didn't I make little, sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then that a district that is at 95 percent is really at 95 percent of 96 percent. A correct. Okay. Correct. And you know there was some discussion today about whether or not it's fair to base that on one day. Um, uh, I don't operate in a vacuum. I deal with a lot of folks and from many districts, uh, folks who live in my district and commute out or vice versa. And so when I hear that our district, for example, is, um, has a lower attendance rate than other districts, I tend to become a little skeptical. And while mm -hmm. you were asked earlier today, do you have any data to support mm -hmm. that, my concern is whatever data you are being given, I'm a little skeptical of because my sources tell me that uh, based upon their, the fact that they teach in districts outside of my district, that there's no way that some of those areas are at 99% or 100% of the base, of the 96%. And so I really encourage that we look at some other way than October 15th mm -hmm. because, and I understand the emotional concern, well, we can't be unfair to a school because students are out one day. But I'm sorry, Commissioner, when, when other districts, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. are being rewarded, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it that way, if, if, they're, if they're being uh, reimbursed or rewarded based upon figures that I don't believe are accurate, then other schools are going to be suffering because there's only so much money. And, and I bring that up in relation to um, the funding formula. Um, and let me ask you a couple of, of questions um, in that regard, and if you would forgive me, I understand that um, if you don't have all of the answers, feel free to get it through the chair to us. But when I'm looking at the, uh, the formula versus uh, where we have a base cost per pupil of $10,555 proposed, this is according to OLS's information on page 22 of their report. And as I understand it, but please correct me if I'm wrong or help me out, if the at-risk concentration is 20%, there's another 0.47 boost, 47% increase, <clears throat> excuse me, in that proposed base funding amount, correct? Correct. If their at-risk concentration is 60% or greater, then it's 57%, am I, am I correct so far? So let's say, for example, the base cost per pupil is 10,555. If their at-risk concentration is 60%, they're going to get approximately another $6,000 per student. I believe that's correct. <clears throat> and the at-risk concentration, the at-risk 
is determined based upon the free or reduced lunch program. Correct. Correct. Now, if they are also, in addition to that, limited English proficiency, there's another 50% of the funding increase. Well, they... Uh, or, or, well, that's what I was getting at. So please explain, if you have both, right. you don't get 40, 57% and 50%, correct? There is, correct, there is a category called combination, right. uh, which specifically addresses that eventuality. So, so then yeah. if I'm understanding the numbers correct, correctly, mm -hmm. if they were, for example, if the school had an at-risk concentration of 0.57%, but also had limited English proficiency, they wouldn't get another one, uh, they wouldn't get another 0 0.50, they would get 0 0.125. Correct. For a total of 69.5%. Well, let's say 70 percent. I believe so. That's for correct. students who yeah. are in qualify for both categories, they'd get an extra 70 percent funding. Um, I believe that's correct. 69.5. Yes. Under the, under, the under the SFRA, correct. I'm sorry. Under the proposed, I'm using 211 uh, 212 school year. Under the proposed, I'm sorry, it'd be 0.46 plus 10.52, or 0.105. Correct. Yep. Okay. So 56, 57 percent, right? So therein lies my problem, and it was said earlier today that those, in those districts, in those areas, those towns where people fraudulently enrolled students in the free and reduced program, they should be embarrassed. Quite frankly, I think they should be prosecuted because they're not getting a $3 a day or so free lunch. If I'm not mistaken, they're getting $6,000 per year for every child that is fraudulently enrolled. Is that correct? That's correct. And I also, if, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, that because the free and, and reduced lunch program is a federally administered program upon which we ride the coattails for these purposes, we're only allowed to order 3%. Is that correct? That, uh, that is correct. There, there, there is a restriction placed, I believe is managed by the Department of Agriculture, that limits the scope of any audit. Any logic in that? None that I'm aware of. So when we did the audit of 3%, we found, in actuality, 37%, is that the number? Am I That's quote? my recollection. 37% of those enrolled in the free and reduced lunch program were done so or enrolled fraudulently? Uh, they found a 37% error rate. Uh, I'm not sure whether that, uh, uh, I pre presumably that was all on the, on the positive side. In other words, over-reporting rather than under-reporting. But I know it was an error rate of 37%. So if 37% of those students mm -hmm. are enrolled fraudulently or mistakenly, mm -hmm. and we can, we can be conservative, we can yeah. say it's a little less than that, but mm -hmm. for argument's sake, I don't think we're reporting when somebody right. was not enrolled and should have been re enrolled. I'm not, I was born on a Sunday, but it wasn't last Sunday. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and so for each one of those individuals, it's likely that they're getting an additional five to $6,000 per student, which translates into millions of dollars. Many, many and, millions of dollars. And so while we could, oh, look, turn the other cheek and say they should be embarrassed, the reality of it is we should be angry because that means all of the other students, because we're spending, I think the figure was $7.8 billion. If we're always looking for more money, maybe we need to spend those $7.8 more prudently where it's deserved and not where it's been taken um, dishonestly. You agree? I agree. Uh, bear with me. I have some other notes here. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to clarify something else from this morning. If you would, uh, the tech fund, which I'm an advocate for, by the way, because I believe if we, um, we take care of the parochial school students, that means we don't have to fund them entirely at the public school level. Mm -hmm. So I've been advocating for that for the nurse, nurse's aid program as well. But... Did you say that that tech fund program was defunded when? I believe it was fiscal uh, 20, 2010. Can I confirm that? It was either 9 or 10. I know I was in the legislature, but yeah. I think back then we had um, the majority party had both houses and the governor's seat. So this was defunded then? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, we will certainly confirm that, but that is uh, my understanding. Because I, I was on the budget committee last year, and yeah. I thought last year was the first year because we were pushing yeah. for it, we were fighting for it. So I thought, you know, that $40 went from 40 to zero last year. So I'd like to know if that was... Sure. Uh, just we, a little different spin on the information that... 
the, yeah, uh, uh, the assumption so, under which I was operating. So um, uh, we're just confirming it. If you give me one second to uh, ask my colleagues. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. Yeah. Because I'm sure yeah. we'll see a flurry of press releases, and I just want to make sure we have that one correct. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, how much per student, approximately? And if you don't have this mm -hmm. through the chair, we can get it later. How much per student do we spend? The states contribution, the, the taxpayers, let me put it, the taxpayers contribution, mm -hmm. state taxpayers contribution. What is the average that we contribute per student in the formerly known as Abbott districts? Uh, it is uh, $15,415 per student and the non-Abbots are $3,200 per student. I'm sorry, 15, let me repeat. 15,415. 15415 in the formerly known as Abbott's, mm -hmm. and in the non Abbott's? Is 3,223. 3,200. So are you saying that we, we give, we contribute five times the amount of taxpayer dollars per student in the formerly known as Abbott districts? That's approximately correct. Um, and ab about, um, I mean, another way to, you know, without. Uh, assigning any value to it, another way to state the math is that 56% of the $7.8 billion in pure state aid that goes out um, goes to 31 out of 600 districts, which serve about 21% of the students in the state. Yeah, because I'm sure we're going to hear that we need to contribute more to those areas, but when I see that we're giving five times the amount, then I have to worry about another figure that we heard earlier today, and someone had said 52% of everyone's property tax bill goes to education. Now that may be accurate statewide, but what percentage of the school's expenses in a formerly known as Abbott district, approximately, goes to fund that school's education, that student's education? So if in a formerly known as Abbott district, they're receiving $15,415 per student on average from New Jersey taxpayers. Then what amount is the local tax bill paying per student? So it'll depend on the district. I can explain that in a moment. But we know that the total amount on average that Abbott's spend, that's including the local contribution as well as the state contribution, is about $21,000 per pupil. So it's... Uh, that, six, that marginal 6,000 that takes us from 15 to 21 is uh, coming from uh, local, and does that include federal? The, the, the comparative? Uh, we're not so sure about that, but it, that will be a small percentage in any event. Okay. Uh, so uh, th I'm sorry, please go ahead. So, so to follow up to that question is mm -hmm. then, if in the non-Abbott districts where they're receiving $3,200 in state taxpayer funding, the balance of which must come from the local property taxes, and if their average expenses are thirteen, fourteen thousand, mm -hmm. so they're paying ten and eleven, or out of their pocket, they're paying double to educate their own children. So well, in absolute dollars, that's absolutely true. I mean, they're rateables. The, the, the whole hypothesis upon which the, the, this is based is to not penalize children simply by virtue of, of the fact that they're born into a district that has low rateables um, and you know so what started out and I'm sorry for the, the, the stump speech here but what started out as a lawsuit based on equalization that is you know the state will essentially fill the gap uh, sending very little money to districts that have a high tax base and a lot of money to districts with a very low tax base was was transformed into something other than that along the way over the last 20 years into a we are now going to try to define what it means to be adequate, and we're going to set a absolute dollar threshold on how much money needs to be spent to meet the, the substantive requirements. Like for those of you who think in these terms, it's like moving from 
an equal protection argument to a substantive due process argument. And I can understand it. If the average across the board yeah. to educate a child was $16,000, and Abbott districts, or formerly known as Abbott districts, could only generate $1,000 and the state had to fill the gap, yeah. I'd understand that. But it seems like year after year after year, we're looking about we're looking towards tax reform, but still over 15,000 in one district, uh, and the rest of the state's getting 3,000 a child. Right. And yet the non-Abbots are educating their children for substantially less than 21,000. And so, I, and I've heard the arguments, classified children, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to ask from you, and through the chair, if you could, you could, could you provide me with a formerly known as Abbott district school budget sure because it just befuddles I, I just cannot understand where all that money is going and and i'd like to see particularly when we're talking about pay to play you know we're going to charge students mm -hmm. we all have that same issue we don't want students to have to pay to participate in sports or after school activities but i want to make sure that we're being treated fairly in my my district because mm -hmm. we're, we're paying our share and uh, we'd be happy to okay and then um the next area and these Answers, I don't necessarily expect that you have these with you, but I'm going to ask, okay, mm -hmm. because it goes back to uh, the federal funding that was afforded the state of New Jersey, <clears throat> pardon me, which was spent in one year instead of over two. And so here's what I'd like to find out. I'm going to try to use the same terminology that we used this morning. In fiscal year 09, how much did the state taxpayers, did New Jersey taxpayers pay or contribute towards school funding, including pre-K? Okay. In, uh, so I've got it for the K-12 on the tip of my fingers here. So in FY09, which I believe was your question, right. Assemblyman, um, the state paid uh, $7.7 .7 $7 dollars. Okay. And uh, while we're talking, we can add to that the pre-K portion, but that's the, the bulk of it is going to be here. And then in 10, fiscal year 10, mm -hmm. it was $7.4 billion. So in fiscal year 10, the state actually, state taxpayers portion was actually reduced by $0.3 billion? In fiscal year, there, there's two fiscal year 10 uh, uh, budgets, so let me get your, your clarification. Okay. There was an original sort of paper proposal in which the state, um, which literally never became, never never came to life. Um, and that was uh, $7.9 uh, million dollars total, but the state portion was $6.8 billion. I said million, I meant billion. It was $6.8 billion. Uh, that was, uh, that never came to life because, you know, the bottom fell out of the economy. And in fact, the amount of state- 6.4. Was, uh, that's the total state and federal, but the state portion of that was 6.4. Right, but of this, and then in 6.4, mm -hmm. we received about 1.2 from the federal government? Uh, about a billion. Okay, so, and actually, so then yeah, actually, right. 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 in 2010, mm -hmm. with the previous administration, the state's contribution was actually less than a year before, correct? It was indeed less than a year before, more than a one. Yeah, you're right. That's your 1.2 billion less. So, yeah. so then, because this is where the the newspaper clippings mm -hmm. and the uh, the press releases um, all go to, to talk about this, in fiscal year 11, the same using the same uh, uh, qualifications mm -hmm. are New Jersey taxpayers. How much did New Jersey taxpayers spend on education in fiscal year 11? 6.85 billion. All right, so now I go from 6.4 to 6.85 billion. Correct. So can we say publicly for once and for all that the state of New Jersey's taxpayers contributed more to education in fiscal year 11 than in fiscal year 10? Because uh, we're constantly hearing that the administration in fiscal year 11 cut the funding, and I just can't help but think, and this has come up many times, that it was re in reality the loss of federal funds. Uh, you can say that definitively. And if, if we phrase it um, this way, and not to, not to mince words, is that the FY uh, 11, um, the state taxpayers um, contributed uh, uh, more than $400 million more than they contributed in 10. 
Do you have any reason to believe that OLS would disagree with you? I doubt, I doubt it very much. It's all in what you choose to present. And why do we keep hearing critics out there talking about the governor lowering the contribution education when he came into office? Well, I'm going to um, uh, defer to those who are more steeped in the science of politics. All right, and then in, in 12, we went to what number? Same, using uh, the same? In 12, we went up from $6.8 billion to $7.6 billion. And then? So it's really more like $7.7 .7 billion, yeah. And then in 2013, in the new budget, it's 7.8. Correct. So I, the, the point that is, I think, absolutely unarguable, and um, I, you should draw, of course, uh, your own conclusions, but is that the budget, regardless of all else, the budget that this governor has proposed for FY13 um, is richer and more generous towards K-12 um, education than any prior um, allocation of state funds to K-12 since the beginning of time. And if we go to a average attendance, maybe picking three days, mm -hmm. would that be random days? Or are we going to announce the three days so those who choose to make up their records instead of doing it one day have to do it for three days? Or are we going to try to be a little more creative or a little more well, realistic? I, li I like the idea of being creative. I, I will just tell you that, that uh, we're designing exactly what that would look like uh, right now, but I like where you're going. I mean, I think we should not be as predictable as, as that. And if yeah. a 3% audit is the maximum mm -hmm. that we are allowed, and we're mm -hmm. finding that maybe 37% is, uh, is abused or fraudulently, uh, has fraudulently enrolled students, isn't there some other criteria we could use? Well, the-, the like, like tax returns? I mean, when you apply, sure. when you well, apply for financial aid, when you apply for when you apply for anything, you have to produce tax returns. Yeah. So, my recommendation, and this started with uh, with our with our with our recommendation, is it starts exactly where you are, which is whatever whatever is happening now, um, we know it's not right. Uh, meaning, whether it is uh, fraudulent or inaccurately on the high side. And by the way, there's some people who argue that there's some uh, parents who feel so stigmatized by getting free lunch that they underreport. But whatever we know, uh, that there is a, there is, um, it is not an accurate number. We also know, and I believe I'm right in this, uh, Assemblyman, that uh, every state does it this way and that this has become a proxy for poverty. What we don't know, because we haven't put our brains against it, is there an equally fair but more accurate way to do it, whether, and I don't know whether to is or is not a good idea, or food stamps, or, or um, uh, you know, I'll give you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the way I would do it, but I've got a major problem to solve, and that is, I am, you know, if we really want to stay on mission, right, we should focus on the kids who are underperforming academically, and we should fund the heck out of those kids, um, and regardless of, regardless of anything else. There are 40,000 kids in the state who can't read. By the, by the third grade, and only half of them are in districts that have more than 50 percent poverty. Uh, and so, uh, now I don't want to create perverse incentive to not educate kids. The less, they, the less well they read, the more money they get. But if we can solve that problem, I think it might be much more targeted, and we do have those data, which is to invest in uh, a higher amount of money in kids that the public school system has failed to date. But the, these are the kind of ideas we should be thinking about. And I have no problem with that. Yeah. In those areas yeah. that need yeah. the extra funding, mm -hmm. provided they prove that. Mm -hmm. Because if they're getting monies that they don't deserve, according to the rules, then someone else is losing out. Some other district right. is losing out, and that's money uh, that's, that's not being afforded to them. And that, frankly, is just not fair. So. Mm -hmm. I think that is all, sir. Let me just check my notes one more. I was going to, I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assemblyman. J just to follow up on uh, Assemblyman Chiosano's uh, okay. question and just for f clarification, and I know he was trying to say about um, what's been categorized as the, the size of, of the 
budget that's going toward education. The way I look at it, math is math, numbers are numbers, and you can call it this, you can call it that, but I could swear that I heard from you that you said 010 uh, was nine, uh, 7.9, if I'm not mistaken, uh, prior to the, the uh, surplus. So my understanding, and we, by the way, we can turn to people who lived it, uh, is that the, uh, the, there was a paper proposal uh, or budget, I As should say. We have today. Of 7.9 uh, se uh, million. That never was distributed to any district. It was, it was literally a, a sort of at a high concept level. But would, that, would you say that was because the, if you had I'm, surplus, you, the funding did not get there, and it was about $400 well, I would million? Say I would say it was because the state couldn't have made payroll if it, if it had gone forward with that concept. Well, regardless of yeah, what, yeah. whatever it was, it was they had uh, they, it was $400 million that was uh, held back from the state. Correct. Well, and, and by the way, and I just want to make sure that the, the three of us are talking about the same numbers. I, I just gave you the total state and federal number, that 7.9. As was just pointed out, even the, the aspirational number was $6.8 billion of state, of yeah. state funds. But, but regardless, yeah. as I said before, once it gets to the school, to the teacher, to the child, it, regardless where it comes from, the total amount was 7.9 sure. as it is. And that's well, what I just want to clarify. Uh, the uh, that was the um, that was the proposed state and federal. But but if I may be, uh, if if you'll allow me to say this, um, it's true from the point of view of the of the school or the district. Um, a dollar is a dollar, no matter where it comes and, from. And I'm going off the governor's chart. That's uh, why. I, 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 but I can tell you that there are other people at work here too, and they're called taxpayers, right? right. So the amount of money that your constituents funded uh, for right. K for K twelve was under any th was actually six point four yeah. billion dollars right. as opposed to the seven point eight billion dollars that we are funding yeah. and this th year. Those state and I apologize yeah. for interrupting, sure. but those those state. You know, those residents that pay state taxes yeah. also pay federal taxes, too. So sure. that's their money also. So that's just my sure. point. Sure, fair so enough. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Cotino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Director. Uh, you know, our good friend on the other side of the aisle, Gary, took us down a real interesting path. And I guess there's a lot of questions I could ask, but just, just to be clear here so we don't spend too much time. I mean, Commissioner, I, I think any rational person will, uh, will admit that socioeconomic factors have a huge impact on the performance of these youngsters. Do they, would they not? Well, I like to think I'm rational and I agree with you. Thank you, because uh, unfortunately sometimes in this building, yeah. rational thought doesn't always win out. Um, my first just uh, points of clarification. In reference to the um, education formula, and a lot's been made out of it already, but I, I just want to be clear. Uh, the lieutenant governor recently appointed, you know, the task force. Will that um, task force exclusively be looking at defining at-risk children? It has a second parallel mission, uh, as I understand it, uh, and that is um, a concern has been identified, the, the scope of which I'm unable to say, that um, certain districts are affording tax breaks and tax incentives to large uh, uh, industries to come into their jurisdiction. Um, and as a result, um, they are obviously paying less taxes, uh, fewer taxes. That's that's the deal. And uh, as I'm sure, as I know you know, um, the way equalization, the biggest slug of state money, is determined, there is something called adequacy, right, which is the sort of constitutional threshold. There is something called local fair share, which is this complex determination about how much the locality should be contributing, and when you subtract adequacy, when you subtract local fair share from the adequacy budget, you're left with the state's contribution called equalization aid. So to the extent that jurisdictions are undertaxing their businesses, it expands, uh, if you follow the algebra here, the equalization aid, the state's contribution. So um, a, the task force, this issue has been raised in hearings such as this, and the task force is also charged with examining that question. Okay, and so now, let's say those issues together with what you've presented this year and there's some concerns with the adjustment in the existing formula, is that what will eventually be this administration's new funding formula? Or are we looking at other, let's say, alternatives into 
possibly addressing the complete financing of education, uh, you know, relooking at the entire system of how we fund well, education? Well, I, 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 I can't speak. I can't speak to the future. I don't think anyone can. Because well, what are you working on? Well, that well, let me let me put it this way: the the, the governor's proposal has a five-year phase in, you know, which is, uh, you know, sounds like a commitment to me, uh, of, of, uh, of that all of these changes um, will roll in over the course of five years. I can't rule in or out the possibility. So, by the way, this education, uh, I'm sorry, funding report represents my best thinking for a rational and fair system. You've got my best shot at this, Assemblyman uh, Catino. I'm not sitting, it's not like I've got some Manhattan project that's that's being hidden somewhere to revisit this okay. uh, again. Well, and here's the, just one one comment on this, and, and I'm concerned to the extent that a task force will even let's say have some, uh, significant work. The best I've seen, there's no budget, there's no staff for this task force, and we've seen you know the we we've been down this road. The higher education task force, you know, basically gave us a useless final report which doesn't, you know, will not do anything to help us with uh, the reorganization of Rutgers, UMDNJ, Rowan. And one of the big problems they had was they didn't have a budget or a staff. So I am concerned, you know, how effective this group will be able to be on such a critical issue to the extent they don't, um, don't have the resources. So I think it's important. To, so your you concern is, 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 is duly noted. I can tell you that um, what usually, ha what, what, can happen, and we, we are uh, on the brink of putting out a very voluminous uh, piece of work called the Education Transformation Task Force, in which was similarly, um, uh, so it ended up that the Department of Education essentially staffed it, and the Department of Education budget essentially retained the experts needed to, to supply the task force members with information. So if your point is that this task force would benefit from additional staff and perhaps even uh, resources, uh, that resonates with me. Okay, um, a different take on, I think, a question that Assemblyman Bersicelli uh, asked this morning, and I wanna wrap a, another component into it. You know, when we started down the experimentation, you know, charter schools were supposed to be laboratories that we were gonna take things from and put into the public school system. I, uh, I'm gonna ask you to comment, what have we taken from charter schools and put into the public school system? I think all we've done is just expanded the number of charter schools. And in, together with that, I'm curious, what are we doing within your budget to mm -hmm. identify business efficiency you know, within um, the dollars that we're giving to the districts? Because I think that was also a question that came up where the county superintendents were supposed to find savings because you know, again, I believe rational people will agree that the Abbott remedies made sense. There's clearly a huge fight over why does it cost so much. So I guess my question is, what have we learned from charter schools? Have we put anything into public schools? And what are we doing to identify business efficiency within what's effectively a $25 billion a year uh, operation in the state? Right. So uh, first of all, on, on, charter, uh, on, on charter schools, um, I think we've learned a lot from charter schools, and indeed there's some very powerful things going on in Newark uh, in particular, in which um, the, uh, there's an effort to not view charter schools as an island, but to view them as an opportunity for sort of a portfolio of great work that inform, informs each other. I think that's one of the more exciting things, and one of many exciting things that's, go that's going on uh, uh, in Newark. I would also um, um, commend to your attention a study by a gentleman by the name of Roland Fryer, F-R-Y-E-R, who is, um, uh, I believe he is a Harvard uh, uh, economist, but he, he is basically engaged in the task of unpacking um, what practices actually are making a difference for disadvantaged children in, in, learning, in, in learning outcomes. Uh, and you know he finds some things, by the way, that are very intuitive. Um, but um, and but he is uh, supporting the mission that you identify, which is turning, you know, making sure those practices are imbued into other schools that are not successful. Your second question uh, was, um, how are we assuring that sound business practices are in? Um, at work, um, it, it, I think implicit in your question is the view that, you know, under any theory, a heck of a lot of money is going out there, and under any theory, we're not getting the results we want in, 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 in certain places. So how do we know that the right things are being done? Well, here I would tell you that we, um, 
we are actively engaged in a process to try to direct that, but I will also tell you we need, you know, your help, uh, your help in that. Is, um, we have basically said um, that um, we are going to have a, if a district is successful and its schools are successful, I happen to believe we should um, get out of the way, police the budgets for purposes of, you know, are they consistent with GAAP, you know, accounting principles, are they consistent with, uh, sound practices and so on but i don't want to be in the business of telling you know a, you know a, a successful district um that you know you can only spend a dollar 25 on lunch and you can't spend a dollar 50 on lunch or the, or that that um you all have to have one custodian for every 17,500 square feet of space i would much rather let the taxpayers um uh, control the budget and let the um and us and we control whether the district is in fact um, su successful. On the other hand, when you look at um, districts and schools that are in the bottom um, decile, pick a number, uh, then I think we need to say uh, in a very aggressive way, we are going to condition your funds on doing things that work. And we're not going to leave it to, you know, we need to, you know, we got a whole bunch of people who need jobs and therefore we're going to give them jobs without really, um, you know, going through the right screens and that kind of thing. So we are, uh, if you read, and I would, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you have read it actually knowing you, but, but if you read our um, application to the waiver in the department, to the U.S. Department of Education, it is full of uh, powers that we propose to exercise to create the linkage between fiscal discipline and academic achievement. Okay, um, somewhat al along these lines, an issue we brought up last year, um, in terms of trying to be more efficient in, ter uh, in general management, if you will, um, I brought up the issue of how are we doing with uniform data management uh, statewide because mm -hmm. it's somewhat perplexing to me that between state and local governments we could spend $25 billion a year. And then we'll have to argue about whose numbers we're using and why things are right. somewhat out of whack. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment what progress, if any, we're making in that regard. And for example, do we have a uniform dropout rate that you could tell us? What was the dropout rate last yeah. year in the state of New Jersey? And also, do we have the former Abbott versus sure. um, you know non-Abbott numbers? Well, uh, w your your point is is well taken. We um, have made, I think, very significant, indeed, exciting advances in data management and reporting, both on the fiscal side as well as on the um, achievement side, to include graduation rates, um, our system, which you know is called NJ Smart, um, has uh, um, made um, tremendous strides uh, going forward. Uh, someone uh, you probably uh, have gotten it over, uh, Barry Ehrlichson is our chief performance officer and she has sort of taken charge of the systems. You know, we are ending the use of certain uh, enterprise systems known as DOE net or DoNet uh, colloquially, which drives our superintendents crazy because a lot of it's managed on Excel or a lot of it is not clearly integrated to having a single common reporting system. Um, and I'm very confident in reporting to you that we have made great progress uh, on that. We are also um, um, uh, about, I believe, a week away um, from reporting um, uh, the uh, the graduation rate and the dropout and the dropout rate, um, which has now been calibrated using an honest and federally mandated um, way of counting. There has been a lot of, and I don't mean this about um, the state of New Jersey, but there's been just uh, speaking nationally, there's been a lot of you know lying, cheating, and stealing about this because people have been counting differently about what constitutes a dropout or what constitutes a. Uh, a, a graduate and the, the the feds got a hold of this problem and as basically as a condition of the era money the federal money we were talking about said no you've got to count this way and our data teams have been hard at work in looking at that so it, it, it is uh, the reason I say exciting is it goes beyond even having a clear number we are going to be able to look at the children in the state who go to college or go to vocational school and look back and say what courses did they take, what teachers did they have, although that's less important, what, what um, uh, uh, you know, how are they performing the third grade or the fourth grade, and start to create individual at-risk reports about kids at a very early age 
um, and go, you know, these are the ones who are in trouble based on generations of kids who came before them. So our data systems are really moving in an exciting direction. Okay. Um, let, me, let me move on. And, you know, an issue which has been uh, much discussed uh, is OSA, the Opportunity Scholarship Act. And, you know, the governor speaks about it uh, all the time. But I have a, something is really strange to me. Why isn't OSA in this budget uh, if it's such a top priority for the governor? Are we talking about a true policy priority or is this just basically, you know, political uh, spin? Well, let me be clear. This is a top policy priority for this governor and for this uh, for Which this is not in the budget. I'm sorry? Which is not in the budget that this committee well, is looking at. Well, that's for. because the, the administrative and overhead costs of administering the program, remember that the actual resources that would go to children to support <laughs> their, their, their education come through tax credits. I mean, the great amount of money comes through that. In terms of the administration of it, my department and my office is poised and ready and eager for a bill, which uh, would be, uh, uh, which we ask you to pass here, um, that we would administer it out of our, out of our own budget. Okay. Um, can you give us an update on the state takeover districts and what progress is being made for them to eventually get, you know, back to local control? So, uh, first of all, I need to be a little bit careful because uh, we have been sued uh, in both Newark and I believe in Patterson on this very issue. So, I, um, if you will uh, forgive me, I'm not going to get too deeply into, into the specifics. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, there is... Um, uh, shall we say a great deal of thought being given to to this issue and I can just tell you at a, at a high level that um, you know this is again my decision um, and I made a decision with regard to Newark which I suspect is the um, the source of your or the immediate source uh, uh, of your question and I would do it again to, I would do it again tomorrow I have the easiest job in the state in one regard right the only people I represent are the children of the state I don't represent adults I don't represent school boards I don't represent anybody anybody but what's in the best interest of the kids and I can tell you that um, the best interest of the children of Newark were served by the course that we took and I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, over time and over a short period of time, um, you know, the governance structure can evolve. But that's, that's my position. But, but now Newark has made significant progress in several areas. Is that correct? Well, Without it, getting too much into the case, but sure. the scores are what they are, correct? So uh, I, I'm just trying to make sure I don't, like, put my foot in my mouth You know, here. I, I would tell uh, you what. You, I, you don't have – one thing, though, that is a little – can you explain to me why Camden is not a state takeover district and Newark still is? I uh, – you know what? I can't. I, I don't mean to be flippant, but if you look at the academic results in Camden, uh, they are devastatingly poor. Okay. I, and I, I would just say, you know, I, I do believe that there's a role for the state to come in and take over districts uh, and, you know, specifically even with as much money that goes – comes from the state – for, um, let's say, the former rabbits. I don't have a problem with ongoing financial monitoring even. It really right. just makes sense. But I do believe to the extent that it's possible for the local community to be as involved uh, and engaged as, as possible would be beneficial. So, but I, I would ask, you know, I mean, that Camden thing and just the latest report that you came out with, uh, and I, I believe that, you know, the other members may ask about that, but I was just curious how that didn't happen. All right. That's uh, – By the way, I, sh I should just say, not to anticipate the Assemblyman's questions, but, but there are um, – uh, there is a process underway here, the outcome of which is, is genuinely not known, that took um, the very low uh, uh, QZAC scores, which are the numbers you're referring to, uh, and is engaged in a process of analysis and investigation, um, which may or may not lead to any one of a number of courses of action. Sure. And, Commissioner, a, a small technical question. I, I just wanted to see if you could verify. As part of the indirect aid, which is increasing, uh, you know, uh, this year, there's $112.6 million, which is uh, scored for debt service on pension obligation bonds. Are these uh, – is this score directly related to – let's say, education employees or, you know, what does that number represent? So I want to just get a sheet of paper in front of me as I re reflect on your question. If you'll give me one second, please. Um, these are the debt service on pension obligation bonds. So, uh, so that's – I found it, $112.6 uh, 
You know, I may be wrong about this, and if I am, I'm, I'm going to correct myself. I believe that um, these date back to the Whitman administration. Yes, they do. When, they, when there was a, uh, uh, basically debt against uh, the pension fund, and this is, ser this is servicing that debt. Am Incredibly right? irrational decision at that point in time from that government, right. but that's, um, and which I was here, by the way, and voted against. Uh, okay. Uh, um, I so, left and came back. Um, I am, um, I, I've now fully exhausted my knowledge of that subject, but so what, what was, it, uh, what was right, the question? All right, well, my, my, my question was, what is this 112.6 million, where does it come from? Is this related to, let's say, a percentage of that bond money that was used for the teacher's pension system, or how did we come up with the score of 112.6? And is there, you know, if you don't have this, maybe you can get that to sure. the chair to us. Um, I'm curious, is this prorated at all, or where, where exactly does this 112.6 come from? And um, that's, that's basically I, I, the question. I believe it is the, 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 the bond schedule. It's the interest schedule on the bonds, and that's just you know, what the bond instruments uh, you know, require. But of the total bonds, or bonds attributable to the education this. department? No, uh, no, I don't think it's the total bonds. But I think they, 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 they reside on the education budget. But I will certainly get you that information. All right. Because, and, and again, and, yeah. you know, without belaboring the point, and I know that Assemblyman Chisano and others have gone back and forth somewhat, you know, the, the point is this is not money, while it might be increase in the budget, this is not money that's going into the classroom. So, you know, we still have a lot of stress uh, on the budget in that regard. Um, all right. Th thank you. The last one for you, Commissioner, and then I have just a question or two for Mark, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, one of the things which, again, being from the inner city and I think is underappreciated, is the value uh, of vocational high schools. You know, and we've had this discussion, you know, briefly. And I see that we've flat funded it. Do you, do you not believe that, let's say, and I heard you and I, I agree with you that the economy is evolving to um, more of the service sector. But when we look at the inner city and the high dropout rate, wouldn't an increase in vocational high school opportunities possibly keep some of these kids that are dropping out right. who give up and say, I'm never going to go to college, so I'm going to drop out, where, you know, possibly I've seen firsthand the ones who, let's say, look at, let me go to the vocational high school and I'll at least have a chance to have a skill. Uh, so I do agree with that, but let me, let me just clarify a little bit. It, you know, in, in, in my era, uh, vocational high school is where you went um, if you weren't sort of on track for, you know, for, for the higher level. Um, uh, now we talk more about, although the lingo is not caught up in this state yet, about career and technical education, uh, which is, um, and essentially what the world is telling us is that to, uh, you know, you don't need to go study, uh, you know, liberal arts, Plato and Aristotle, et cetera, um, um, but to be, to pursue a meaningful career in technical education, you still need a serious, you still need a serious education in math and uh, and science uh, and, and the rest. So um, I certainly endorse um, the support we provide to our vocational schools, that we as a state do a very good job on that, uh, I, I think. And I certainly endorse providing a career and technical education, both in that context and in our general um, education schools. And, you know, nobody wants to uh, do anything but say that the career path that those students take is equally as valid and just as important and just as noble as those who uh, you know, take, the, take a, a more liberal arts approach. And again, I know that it's a relatively small piece of the whole picture, mm -hmm. but in Essex County as an example, I believe that of every three kids who wants to go to vocational high school, there's only one spot. And now, right. you know, I can't help but wonder, you know, how many of these kids now end up dropping out and might have been saved if we had a little right. bit more space for them. So right. I would ask that the department keep an open mind sure. on that to the extent in those areas where there is a greater demand and supply, we try to expand the opportunities. If anything else, you know, if one of the, your legacies will be that, you know, the dropout rate, if we can basically keep, you know, several thousand more children from dropping out, um, you know, I think is something we should look at. In fact, one of the interesting things I've seen through some children that, you know, I'm involved with in other youth programs is they go into vocational school and then sure enough, they weren't thinking about going to college. They end up getting motivated, they're successful, and they do go on to college, you know? So I, I definitely think uh, we have a crisis in, clearly in our urban areas mm -hmm. and we need to be open to everything, high-performing charters, OSA, increasing vocational <laughs> education. So I would ask 
that you, you know yeah. you look at it I know you have a lot on your plate but uh, well, I, I, I agree with you. let me call out the, the and uh, the I think the Estes County Vocational School has got a tremendous leader who's doing some very very uh, uh, interesting things yes uh, and I, I agree with the sentiment you expressed thank you thank you Commissioner director Larkins good afternoon how are you <laughs> good afternoon assemblyman I'm fine and you uh, I'm hanging in I'd be better if we have some more cranes in the air all right um, now, I, just a few very specific questions. I need to reiterate, you know, the frustration, and you've heard it, you know, time and again. And I, I do, I, while I want to thank you for putting up with my calls and returning my calls all the time, you know that the frustration is very real. Uh, this board, this committee has heard that I ran, I came to the legislature because of the school construction issue. Uh, my host community had 70 of the original 172 new schools that were supposed to be built from the original court decision of after the first boondoggle, none of them got built, the big zero. And till this date, we still don't have any. Now, the, you know, your office and the governor have committed to building two, and, I, and I'm thankful for that. But, um, you know, we're just, the, the pain is real, and I know that there were mistakes made, and we really need to start moving forward with this. Uh, some very specific questions. Uh, the, you know, the, the 3.9 that was appropriated, if you will, or authorized to be appropriated uh, back in 08, how much of that money has been spent to date? Or have we tapped that at all, or are you still just finishing up first generation dollars? We are essentially right on the verge of transitioning. So we have spent a little of the 3.9 billion. Uh, but we really are ex at, at the point of exhausting all of the original allocation and moving into the new. All right. Has any of the billion for non-Abbots been uh, already allocated? Because the, it's yeah, 2.9 yes. in a billion, right? Yes. I, approximately 45 to 50% of that has been committed. And when I say committed, because of the way the ROD grant program works, um, we offer the grants and then we account against the money. Um, some of those get executed and then they get advanced. Some actually never get executed because of a district's failure um, to provide information or other issues that come up. But right now we have about 45 or 50 percent of that on the street, for lack of a better term. All right. So, so half of that has been approved, but you actually haven't paid out yet because they, let's say they're, they're getting started. That's fair to say. All right. And you have not, we have not bonded any of the 2.9 then for the former rabbits, correct? With the 52 schools, which are 52 or 53? that was on that list? I think we have bonded a very small percentage of it, uh, but it, it's, it's insignificant, yes. Okay. Now, um, I know, just correct me if I'm wrong, last year you approved, well, you announced that you were moving forward with 10 schools, correct? Yes. Now, what did you, you earlier this year you announced an additional, I believe, eight and then five. Can you explain exactly what you announced and committed to this year? Sure. In total this year we announced another 20, projects. Uh, eight of those 20 are defined school projects. In other words, we know which school, which population we'd like to target population we'd like to serve. Uh, the, another group of seven, uh, the data from the school districts identify the need, but we have not identified the school project yet. In other words, for most of those districts, uh, they, they have requests for a number of projects. We have to sit with the districts to identify the most appropriate one to advance at this time. And the remaining five of those projects are actually significant rehabilitation projects. And, and at this point, the intent is not necessarily to provide a replacement school, but the scoping hasn't been finalized yet, so it may morph into something different than what we anticipate today. Okay, so let's say the work you've been doing the last two plus years you're comfortable with these 10 plus 8 plus, and then the 7 and 5 other things that are going on, correct? Yes. Now, if you've, if you've made the determination and eliminated any schools off of that, let's say the list you inherited that had 52 or 53, or where are you with, let's say, the future of the, the balance of those schools? Sure. We, we have not made a decision to eliminate any requested project or any project previously identified. What happened with the list of 08, and I know we've, we've gone through it, but to uh, summarize is essentially there was criticism of the prioritization effort that was done in 08 that arrived at that list of 52. What we did is engage in a new prioritization review, uh, which led us to the identification of new projects. But the projects that were on the list of 52 
are still out there. Um, but with the new prioritization effort, it really is just us um, identifying our sequence of moving through the projects because the, the, the list of requested projects um, exceed 100. So. All right. Um, if, if you can, given the timelines you have now, let's fast forward a year from now, you know, May of 2013, how many active construction sites do you believe we will have in the state, uh, throughout the state? I, is well, it sir, short of 18? Is it 10? Is it? I think it will certainly be in the double digits. If I had to guess in terms of active construction sites next year, I would say, I would predict between 10 and 15. Okay. Well, that's a lot better than, than where we are now. And again, uh, you know, as we've discussed, I believe this has been, well, let me, let me backtrack. While I think it's appropriate for the uh, administration to be as thorough as possible, I do believe we've lost an opportunity to, to stimulate the economy by having delayed this as much. And I would ask whatever you can do, you know, so that we can get folks back to work. You know, we've seen the employment numbers continue to be very soft. We, we took a little bit of a step backward last month as a state. Uh, and, you know, I think we can save money. The, the, while the economy is soft, if we're building these schools, you know, we should be coming in under, under budget. So uh, last question for you, Mark. In, in terms of the emergent projects, I know that there was a lot made on that. Can you tell us the status, the, the status of the emergent projects? Sure. I, and I, I'll, I'll try to be brief in that. And I, I just want to address this idea that um, we haven't been doing any emergent projects because that is entirely not true. Um, just give me one second. I'm sorry. So speaking specifically about our emergent uh, project program since 2010, um, from 2010 to present, uh, we've completed approximately 27 emergent projects that we self-manage, meaning the SDA managed it from beginning to end, uh, totaling over $22 million. Um, there were another 13 emergent projects that we delegated out to the districts and gave them responsibility for that were completed during that same time frame. Uh, in that same two-year time frame, we have initiated another 32 emergent projects that are in some form of advancement right now, so those would be considered active. And during that same time frame, we delegated another 81 emergent projects out to the school districts to complete themselves. In terms of the latest review, which has certainly received um, a fair amount of attention, last summer we essentially reached out to every uh, former Abbott, now SDA district, to get an idea of what emergent needs they had. Um, they identified over 700 projects. And I just want to talk about the breakdown of that for a moment because in fairness to them, when we reached out, of course, they, they, anything that they had, they identified Kitchen and seat. put on the list, of course. Um, the issue, though, with the Emergent Project Program is it is um, very tailored and specific through both legislation and through DOE regulation in terms of what type of project actually qualifies as an emergent. So of that list of 700, there were 76 at the end of the day that essentially met the criteria for being called an emergent project. What I will say about that 76 is that number has decreased a little because there were some projects that were at schools that districts have now decided they are not going to continue to use. So the number ends up being around 70. So that begs the question, what happened to the, old, the other 600 plus projects? What I will tell you about that is about 315 of those projects were deemed to be um, uh, typical or ordinary um, uh, uh, routine and required maintenance. In other words, th there were conditions that the districts themselves should have been taken care of or should take care of. Uh, there were another 320 or so that were identified as uh, capital maintenance projects, which would um, include things like upgrades to systems. So for instance, if a school doesn't have air conditioning, adding air conditioning doesn't meet the criteria of an emergent, but it would be something that a district would want, but that would fall into a category of capital maintenance, um, which would not be an emergent project. And then there were another 13 or so that represented full-blown school facilities projects where districts said, well, we need new classrooms. We need something more that would actually be a school facilities project. So of that, of that uh, big pool of 700, 
We narrowed it down to about 70 that met the criteria. Of those 70, there are about 25 or so that we're looking to get started this year. Uh, for the remaining 45 or so, what needs to happen is two, one of two things. One, either the solution needs to actually be designed, so we need to hire an architect to design the fix, and or the other uh, issue with some of them are we need to bring in an expert to actually identify what the cause of the condition is. So a district, for instance, may say, well, we have cracks, so we have water infiltration, uh, but it's not uh, readily obvious as to what's the cause of the condition. So we need to bring in experts to, to identify those. So that really is a summary of the state of our emergent program. Okay. Well, um, Director and Commissioner, while you know, I have extreme frustration, and I want to thank both of you for being very responsive. Um, you know, you guys both spend a lot of time in the city of Newark, and I guess that's a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> it's good because it shows you are responsive uh, administrators. It's also bad because it shows that there's you know persistent serious problems there that need to be addressed. Specifically, you know, when we look at my host community and the problems that both of you were there hand in hand with me at Wilson Avenue. We're talking uh, to my colleagues may not know this was a school in my district since the current administration took over has now been forced to be closed twice because there were not conditions for the students to be there um, and it just really amplifies you know in a community that every single building is well over 100 years old every single building well over 40 percent overcrowded we need to uh, move the program forward but I really want to thank both of you. You have been responsive to the, you know, the many problems we have, and hopefully we, you know, continue to work together and get these skill schools up as soon as possible. Thank you both uh, for your help. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assemblyman. Assemblyman Buchel. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate your testimony today, uh, along with your willingness to think outside the box in. Uh, in finding ways to better uh, our educational system here in New Jersey. I just have just, just one brief question, mm -hmm. and you touched on it a little earlier, and that is in the teacher evaluation pilot program. I know my colleague, uh, Assemblyman O'Scanlan, spoke to you about it a little bit. But I guess I'd like to know just a little bit more. How is it going? Um, you know, how many schools are involved mm -hmm. in the program? And, and, and I have to tell you, I spent a day in a kindergarten class. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say as a teacher because I don't think there was much teaching going on the day that I was there. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out what was going on for the most part. But um, I, I, it struck me as I did that that um, how is an evaluation process going to take place between the different levels? You know, like how do you evaluate a kindergarten teacher versus a high school teacher? And is that what part of this pilot program yeah. is trying to sort out? Uh, excellent question, and it's precisely what this pro pilot program is attempting. <coughs> excuse me to, to to sort out. Um, there is a um, <coughs> pardon me. There's a deep challenge in the realm. That's all right. You didn't, <laughs> stunned me into submission. Uh, uh, there's a deep challenge uh, in the area of what are called untested grades and subjects, meaning. Um, Whatever else one thinks about this enterprise, in the third through the eighth grade reading and math, we have a federally mandated examination. It's called the NJASC uh, uh, in this state. And uh, the statistical problem of attribution is, is, is easiest to solve in those areas because you know who the fourth grade teacher was or the third grade teacher. It's still hard. Uh, because there are influences that are exogenous to what goes on in a particular classroom, but it's the easiest to challenge in there. Where um, the enterprise uh, requires um, tremendous creativity and a very open mind is in the untested grades and, um, and subjects. So let me give you a couple of hard examples. The, uh, the drama teacher, even, in the, even at the high school level, or your example, the, 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 kin the kindergarten teacher. So what we have asked um, districts to do is to start with a really, I think, fundamental premise, which is that what we care about is student learning. There's two ways to think about the educational enterprise. There are inputs and there are outputs. You know, the input is things like class size or, you know, the school that the teacher went to or whatever, whatever it may be. The output is how much the children learns in this common core progression towards college and career 
readiness. So what we have said is the system we are building, when it finally sort of lands, must have 50 percent of the evaluation based on um, practices, inputs, that is observation, for example, whether it's peer observation, administrator observation, or other, and 50 percent based on student outcomes. But what, and again, this is what uh, seems to often get missed in the debate, that doesn't mean based on the test or based on a test. There are a lot of ways to think about student outcomes. I can tell you that um, the kindergarten turns out to be a profoundly important year in the educational life of kids. Um, it is a real, the kids who come out of kindergarten with what are called pre-literacy skills are much more likely to be reading on, uh, you know, on, on grade level. There are, so, so the, the, the defeatists of this enterprise would say, well, you know, this is just too hard, right? How do you really know? Um, you know, we're just going to judge it if we walk in. Uh, do the kids feel happy and fulfilled? And does the teacher feel like she's sort of spiritually engaged in the enterprise uh, of teaching? So, I, you know, I, I, while I think all of that is deeply important, I think we should also be looking at or, or designing measures around our children achieving the pre-literacy skills that are going to be critical to their to their future lives. So essentially the way we've cut this is we said to districts, you need to give really hard thought to how you're going to evaluate learning outcomes, particularly in these untested grades uh, and, and subjects. And we're open to pretty much anything you come up with, but we don't want you just focusing on the inputs and we don't want you ignoring uh, how much children are learning. So that is exactly what uh, this pilot is attempted to develop, attempting to develop. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman. Assemblyman Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner and Director. Pleasure. It's been a long day. <laughs> most of my questions, um, yeah. or most of my issues, uh, have been, I've heard uh, discussed in this forum here. So I have a few um, uh, small items that have come up from different um, people who sent letters to me. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one uh, is out of, um, out of Lakewood. And it's something they call the Supplemental Educational Service. Mm -hmm. You familiar with that? I am. Yes, the sir. Federal, it's a federal program. Yes. Is there an, is there a state match to that, or? Well, if if I may, yeah. let me explain. Uh, let me explain how that works and where our thinking is on that. So, uh, SES is a, 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 a federally devised uh, program under the No Child Left Behind Act that essentially says that. Um, Every district that receives Title I must reserve 20% uh, of its funds um, to make available. Uh, it's actually for two basic, two basic baskets. One is so-called choice, and that is for, um, you know, if students are at a failing school, to be transported to a non-failing school, and that has turns out to have had relatively minimal um, um, effect nationally over the years. And the other is for um, uh, parent chosen um, tutoring services for children. And that's what, that's what SES, Supplemental Education Services, where essentially a parent can, um, uh, in a Title I district, can choose a uh, tutor. And it, they, they can be you know, organizations you've heard of, like Huntington Learning or yeah. Sylvan, or they could be, there are a lot of, a lot of these organizations. Um, when we sought um, a waiver from the No Child Left Behind Act, as we had a chance to talk about before. The way it was presented to us by the federal government is you could basically waive essentially all or none. And so we now are in a position of having waived supplemental educational services, meaning that those same Title I dollars come to the districts and go to the districts, but unless we amend our, our decision, um, SES is no longer mandatory. In other words, that districts are not required to cabin off a certain uh, quantum of money and to, uh, and to make it available. Now, we're frankly in the process of thinking about um, what's the right way to deal with this, because certainly we all agree that extended learning opportunities, whether tutoring or Saturday um, learning opportunities or extended day, um, are all very important. And so we're trying, uh, and I, I wish I could be more definitive, Assemblyman, we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out um, exactly um, how we want to land this airplane with regard to the former SES services uh, and the uh, Title I money and the opportunity for. So the, the money uh, for that district is, is still available? Oh, yes. Or the money, uh, yeah. And
Strix historically paid, played terrible games with this SES money because the, the federal rules were to the extent parents didn't choose tutoring services uh, that uh, the, and, and therefore the money was not spent down, it goes into the general treasury of the district. So districts historically played a lot of games to suppress demand. So DOE is holding this, these funds right now? Well, the funds will end up... For, I mean, for a specific district I'm talking uh, about. For like the, the funds actually, the way it's situation, uh, situated right now is the funds that will go in an unrestricted form, effectively unrestricted form, to the district. So that we, they, won't, they won't reside with us. They are going to go to the district. But whereas before a district uh, was required to spend those funds on SES, now it will no longer be. Yeah, uh, I guess my question actually is, yeah. when you release these funds to that district, there will be oversight to assure that, it, that this yes. money is spent for tutoring or, or other services that these uh, uh, apparently uh, low income, because in the letter here they state that uh, uh, a majority of the uh, students there are on a free lunch or a reduced lunch program. So I, I suspect that Lakewood uh, is a, right. a, a lot of low income students. So, uh, that, that's true, but if, S if SES, if we, we stick with our opening position, which is SES is waived, um, then no, they, they, they the, those funds would go to the general treasury of Lakewood in particular, and they would spend that. Now, again, we are, um, you know, we believe deeply, and, you know, one of the few things that research tells us is longer day, longer year, individual uh, learning services actually make a difference. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, we are exploring a number of ways so you to make sure. So it may go in that direction. It may very well go okay. in that direction. Yeah. A, a different plan. Okay. Yeah. I, I should also tell you that this industry has tremendously powerful lobbying, uh, and that it would not shock me in the least if um, there was uh, a very deep effort to try to uh, defend, protect SES as it exists from the modifications that we're considering. Okay. You know, let's go to modification. I like that term. Uh, and, and this modification in the plan, uh, mm -hmm. what is the plan for preschool expansion or? or to ensure that uh, the preschoolers uh, who need this, uh, uh, I guess, ass additional assistance, right. what is, is, do you have any a plan for that for those students who either, or are low income or are or, or behind their peers? So I'm, I, I want to make sure I respond accurately to your question. So, you know, this governor and this administration are very committed to pre-K to pre and, and preschool. And we've seen every year since I've been here an actual increase in the in the state dollars that are committed to pre-K, and this year is no exception. I believe it's 14 million and change additional uh, additional um, in in pre-K. Um, we have uh, the pre-K program is a uh, six-hour program where it exists. It's in it's basically in the former Abbott districts and a handful of other places um, as well. Unlike most states, it is available for both three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Most states, it's just a four-year-old program. Um, it, it incorporates uh, both uh, publicly provided and private providers, like a lot of our pre-K programs are in, actually physically managed by the, by the districts, and some of them are essentially outsourced to private, to private um, providers. Um, I, I want to make sure I don't get ahead of where your question is, but there is there is a question that um, about something called wraparound services. Is that perhaps where you're? Uh, no, I think you answered, you answered my question. I did. Okay, very good. Thank we you. can go wraparound. I like to hear no, that. No, that's too. okay. That's all right. <laughs> the hour is late. <laughs> okay. All right. I wanted to hear it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm happy to respond. No, that's okay. We'll move on. Yeah. Uh, you've had uh, several. Well, you've had a conversation or dialogue with uh, my colleague in the 37th, Senator Weinberg, regarding. Uh, the GED. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to clarify uh, what she has been told by, I guess, by you regarding some concerns that there may be a change in the GED. Right. Are you, are you plan on privatizing that? Do we plan on privatizing it? Or no. going to? No, I don't. I don't think so. So we we um, uh, were. Are you going she, to a computer-based? Uh, uh, correct. We are piloting a transition to a um, computer-based delivery of the of the te of the of the test itself. That's with a vendor. Um, you know, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. Do we know? Is that? Yeah, it's a vendor national. Uh, it's a national. It's a, it's a, na a national vendor. This is the administration of the actual examination itself. Yes. And uh, well, maybe you could <laughs> advise us. Is this a? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's no changes planned for fiscal year 13 other than the pilot that the commissioner was talking about, but there is a national movement to 
you know, computer-based testing, and also uh, we're looking at options, I guess, for fiscal year 14 and beyond. Okay, so, so 2014, you'll probably have a computer-based GED system. Uh, not necessarily. I think we're looking at a bunch of different things, and the commissioner can jump in. Uh, part well, of yeah. okay. Let me tell you where I'm, where I'm going. Yeah. With. Here's my concern with this. Yeah. Uh, being as I said on law and public safety, and also a uh, former sheriff, our reentry program that we've worked on in, in, in this in this body here, for those individuals who are incarcerated, either in jails or prisons. Where I'm told that the uh, in the prison system the average uh, education is like sixth grade, uh, and we worked on ensuring that or trying to ensure that when a person left our prison system, they at least have a GED. Now, we talk about this computer-based system. How does a in, how does an, an inmate get a computer to take this? Where are they going to come from? That's my question. Well, I think what still I mean, in the planning I, stage, I guess. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna quickly jump in. I think one of the reasons we're doing this as a pilot is to make sure that we not only do no harm, but we also do good. And I completely embrace the reentry work that you're you're talking about. And one of the things we would need to make sure is that there was an accommodation, either as I know is the case in some correctional facilities, with the with uh, with access to to a computer, the library, or, or, or elsewhere, or by having a non-computer-based delivery um, delivery system. But uh, the program you describe, and I've actually had a chance to learn a little bit, learn a little bit about it. Uh, it's been very effective in Newark, for example, um, is a, um, uh, you know, it's certainly not one that we would that, want. Is that a prison in Newark or just Newark? No, no, well, the, I know that this is something that Mayor Booker, for example, has been very um, supportive okay. of, of, uh, of reentry programs. Um, uh, so we would certainly want to be very sensitive to that concern as we evaluate our options in this, and I will commit to you that, that we will be. But this is very early on in the thinking. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to put it out there now because I have the microphone. <laughs> uh, the fee for, this, for a GED course, was it, $50, I think, about? Yeah, yeah it's uh, $50 currently, yes. Will that fee increase if it goes to a private to this other vendor? Yeah, well, not, not next year. Well, well under 2014. Year, 2014, we're still. That's what we're still looking at. We're going to pilot it, and we'll we'll see. Because uh, I was given a number of two hundred dollars to to take a GED, and it's based on information where this yeah. this company has uh, done some work in, in another state, where they charge you two hundred dollars to take to take a GED course, which I think is a bit much for a person of, of low income. And well, it, but. That's just, I'll put that out there as a concern sure. of mine. Sure. Uh, another, another item that came up, back to the GED, one, one more GED issue is um, the requirement for people to have a valid state ID. Uh, and and um, on your web page it says here, a person who is at least 16 years of age, if not graduated from accredited high school, uh, can uh, register in this program. However, where does a 16-year-old get a valid state ID, or even 17, if, if it doesn't have a license with? What IDs are accepted by the program? You have to get back to me with that? We'll have to, we'll have to get back to you. We're gonna have I know it says, yes. it, it, yeah. web, it says passport, but I don't think it has an address on it, which you'd have to have an address on this ID. Okay, we talked about graduation rights. You're going to put out something you said? Uh, in, the, in the quite near future, we're going to... Uh, put that out there. Will that be by district, or by? We, it will be by district, as a matter okay. of fact. All right. Uh, funding for adult education. Where are we with that? Give us one second, if if you might, please. I believe the department is at zero for adult ed, but labor has programs. I'm sorry to hear. The adult ed has been uh, zero for the last two or three years, and but I think labor has some programs outside of uh, what Department of Ed 
provided. So that's been cut from the DOE budget, right? Funding for adult education for the, for the last several years, as we understand. Mm -hmm. And my last uh, question is um, New Jersey after three. So uh, how this much is, is uh, there? There are no state dollars um, allocated to it. Um, there is certainly. Um, a, uh, 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 an effort to preserve it, and my understanding is that there has been um, some uh, promising conversations with philanthropists to fund it, and we have been trying to work with NJ after three. There was a uh, contribution made, I think, last year of, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the amount is. Could you tell us how much is in the account now to uh, going forward? There, for is, the there is no, uh, zero. Uh, there's, there's no dollars appropriate. Nothing to provide to uh, yeah. New Jersey after three. Right. By the way, we have extensive. I mean, one of the one of the, the um, concerns that I think uh, has uh, um, uh, animated this is uh, we have extensive after-school programs. For example, our 21st century grants. Uh, we are very supportive of, of, of after-school. We understand its role in education, and we are uh, investing heavily in it. NJ After Three uh, actually, as I understand it, doesn't provide after-school services. It has basically been a broker of services for other for other entities, uh, and so that particular entity, as opposed to after school in general, um, 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 is is not is not directly funded by the state this year. Okay, I thought the governor said he was going to find some funding for this. He is. He is. The governor uh, said that he is working with NJ after three, and that is through us. Um, I uh, had to find funding, but that would not be public dollars. That would be from private sources. Okay. All right. Uh, Chair, that, thank you. Thank you very much. And Chair, thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Commissioner, if, if I could just um, follow up on uh, Assemblyman Johnson's question in reference to expansion of daycare. I know there's over $14 million into pre-K, uh, but for as per the 2008, we. Um, I know the former Abbots were supposed to go to full pre-K, which I think they did, and we were supposed to be phasing in. Uh, a few of them did after that, but that has been stagnant. Is there any idea of expanding that eventually because of the cuts in human services for, for daycare and it's sorely needed? So uh, th this isn't a matter of this administration. I mean, the, oh, I'm, the, I'm not saying it right, is. I'm no, just the, saying moving forward. We, we have fully funded the pre-K, yeah. which is the six-hour program for three- to four-year-olds, you know, all the Abbott districts and a handful of other, mm -hmm. and a handful of other uh, districts, but that, that program has not expanded beyond that. So, so I, by the I, way, that's a huge investment. I, I think I, and I do know that, and it's been yeah. five years, and that's why I said it. I, sure. I know it's not of, of your making, but do we plan on doing this because that is sorely needed. And I can tell you, uh, as a father of my two kids that went through pre-K, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it actually shows. Sure. Well, I, I agree with you. So, um, so that's why the state, with your support, um, is proposed to, to send uh, 633 million dollars uh, in, in, into pre-K, which is, as we talked about a moment ago, up from the, the, the from from prior years. Uh, the the precise number, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, there are 35 fully funded districts, the 31 former uh, Abbots, and then. Right. Little Egg Harbor, Fairfield, Woodbine, and Red Bank, uh, for I'm sure historical reasons, um, have that. There are about uh, 45,000 children uh, in the state uh, in, in pre-K programs. There are also 111 other partially funded uh, districts that have an early childhood program, but not the full day pre-K. But at this time, we have none, at nothing time, for expansion. Uh, it, it's just not fiscally um, uh, you know, realistic for anyone um, to commit to expanding it further beyond that. I mean, this is already a uh, very, very deep, uh, deep, com deep commitment. But I, I would not, I mean, to be mm -hmm. candid with you, I would not anticipate, you know, unless the legislature takes this in a different direction, um, a, an expansion beyond the current scope. Okay. Th thank you. Assemblyman Mueva. Thank you, Chairman. And through you, Commissioner, thank you for your you. Uh, testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, Always learn something new when you come before us, and um, I just want to share with you my my enthusiasm um, and uh, commitment to uh, improving our children's schools. Not just because I have a bunch of kids going through the schools, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, improving the, the schools for all New Jersey's kids. Uh, 
through uh, increased accountability and, and greater choice um, and, and doing it in innovative ways. And I want to thank you for uh, bringing some of those ideas uh, to our state and thank working you. so diligently in, uh, in uh, implementing them. I had two sets of questions or maybe discussion points to, uh, to cover with you. One is uh, rather more general and the other is very specific and, and kind of bite-sized. Mm -hmm. uh, the first more general issue uh, comes to me through your testimony and listening and, and reading it. And I, I, you said this uh, in your testimony. I think you said it again in response to a question. And it's certainly in your written testimony. You make a point of saying that uh, the effectiveness of the teacher in front of the classroom is the most important in-school factor in raising student achievement. You, you made that clear. It was in-school factors. Correct. Implying that there are out-of-school factors that would uh, also play a large role in improving student achievement. Can you uh, discuss some of the out-of-school factors that research is showing that is uh, most important for improving student achievement? Oh, there are. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. The, I mean, but the, there is obviously a very high correlation between poverty and education attainment. That's the enterprise that we're all engaged in to try to um, use our schools to correct, to, to correct for that. So the, the specific inclusion of the phrase in school was meant to be in juxtaposition to the, the influences of poverty, uh, of poverty. Now, when you break that down into some of its component, component parts, um, it certainly includes parental involvement. Uh, it certainly includes you know, access to words. I mean, there's some very jarring studies out there that show that children who grow up in impoverished circumstances are literally exposed to a fraction of the words uh, in their early years uh, that uh, children who grow up in other circumstances are, are uh, exposed to. Um, you know, health uh, you know, is certainly relevant. You know, literally having you know, food in your stomach when you, when you go to school. So, but, but they're all sort of subparts uh, uh, of, of that. I'm sure there are other factors as well, but that is, that, that, that is the dominant out of school uh, consideration. And you know, it can lead to, as, as it has, a very lively and sometimes heated debate around you know what is the true mission of uh, of schools are um, is are um, and I can tell you that as much as I hope that you know legislative bodies and our society uh, addresses the concerns uh, of, of, of poverty um, I know that um, and, and while I understand that there are things that schools absolutely can do to try to mitigate some of the implications of poverty you know, the education system's core competence um, is in the realm of education. And, and, and these are children who are with us for six to eight hours a day. Um, and I am convinced that we can do better with children who face disadvantage and that we should deploy all of our resources and all of our political courage around that enterprise, uh, which doesn't mean that um, we should be defeatist about the implications of poverty. But I think to say to me, for example, which I know is not where you're going, is as well, until you fix poverty, you can't fix education, which is what some people want to do. Um, I, I actually think that in the end is, um, is defeatist because it takes schools off the hook. Schools can do a lot better, and they are every day, serving kids of, uh, across the continuum uh, of need in this state uh, and, and across the country. There are plenty of schools who are serving very high needs kids, and they're hitting the ball over the fences. We're just not doing it enough. Could you talk more or describe for me any initiatives that you have in mind, um, if there are any, mm -hmm. to increase parental involvement or try to try to get parents in all communities, but especially sure. um, in communities with uh, more challenges than others, uh, involved in their, in their uh, children's academic lives? Sure. So there are some schools in the state, for example, um, that ask, um, and I, I'm, I'm not advocating this, but it's an interesting approach. They ask parents actually to sign a contract um, guaranteeing they'll come to parent-student conferences, for example, guaranteeing that they will read to their children uh, um, at night. Now, you can't, I can't say that we can police this or that we want to live in a society that polices this, but um, simply the asking um, uh, is important. Um, there are schools that, um, again, in this state, that whose teachers are, you know, and, 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 and other staff on the school, literally when a child doesn't show up, will go and knock on the door of the apartment or the home and say, where is the child, or the, your child is falling, uh, and it's starting to, 
to, to slip and, and get engaged and try to engage the parents and try um, in the in the sort of joint enterprise of education. So there are, are you know you know you could fairly say these are things sort of around the edges uh, a, a little bit, but I do think they're meaningful and part of our strategy in um, these so-called turnaround strategies that Assemblywoman um, uh, and I were talking about um, uh, have to do with the strategies of community and parental engagement and how student schools can be brought into the, the, the business of, of fostering engagement. Great, thank you. Uh, second, more bite-sized, very specific issue, but one that's important uh, certainly to my community, uh, but also uh, a number of legislators uh, on the committee, was a concern that was brought to us uh, during the public hearings uh, for uh, this budget year by uh, a superintendent of, of uh, schools uh, from my hometown, Morris Plains, uh, over the issue of um, uh, the responsibility of uh, paying for the education of children in uh, transitional uh, living facilities, whether they be the children of victims of domestic violence mm -hmm. or, or the children of uh, homeless families. Mm -hmm. And uh, a recent administrative law or a series of administrative law decisions has uh, put that burden on the community that houses these families. Um, first time in, in years, I think first time ever, that the communities have been expected to uh, pay for the um, education of, of these children and uh, really kind of breaks a, not just a tradition, but a promise that was made to communities mm -hmm. who um, have uh, allowed these uh, facilities to uh, be placed in their communities willingly and happily to help uh, families who are uh, in trouble, uh, collect no property taxes on them, obviously, um, but the deal was that the, uh, the sending districts would be responsible for the education of the children who would reside in those facilities. Uh, that has now changed, and um, a, a small school district uh, like mine in Morris Plains uh, finds itself unexpectedly stuck with a special education bill because, of course, some percentage of the children in, in transitional living facilities are going to have special education needs. Uh, those bills can get rather large rather quick for uh, especially small communities. Um, this, uh, this issue affects probably as many as uh, 750 to 800 uh, children across the state and all the communities that have agreed to uh, house them, and again, happily house them. Um, but uh, I wanted to bring it to your attention. It was uh, something that I think caught the, caught the attention of most of the members of the committee, mm -hmm. uh, both parties. Um, obviously, these facilities are all over the state um, in uh, many, many legislative districts. And our real concern is, first, of course, for the, the, um, the in the facilities. Uh, secondly, the, the budgets for the communities that are hosting them. But thirdly, uh, for the future of these facilities and encouraging other towns uh, to uh, host them. Uh, if, if, if the host communities are continued to uh, be required to, to fund the education for um, children in these facilities, it would be a disincentive to put the facilities up at all, and so I wondered if, if that had made your radar screen, if it hadn't, we wanted to put it on your radar screen and, and perhaps speak with you. We don't have to hash it out um, at, at the hearing, but wanted to uh, flag it for you, Commissioner, and uh, ask you to work with us to find a, a, an equitable solution to it. Well, I'm committed to doing that, and thank you for, uh, for uh, bringing it to my attention. I, I just, I, perhaps we should do it offline, but I, can I just understand one or two? One or two points. I do know that we have a line in the budget for children without residence, uh, for homeless, for, for homeless uh, children. It's actually quite, is that what you're doing? It's quite a substantial uh, a line. Unknown, they're not, they're, uh, it looks like there's $39 million uh, in the line for uh, institutionalized children or unknown district of residence. What I hear you saying, and I, I'm learning as you, as you talk, is that the minute a child is transferred to a transitional facility, uh, he or she goes from being, you know, whatever circumstances he or she was in before, to a person who has a residence uh, a, a, attributed to the district in which that transitional facility is located. So if a child, if there's a transitional facility in, what did you say, Morris Township? In, Morris Plains. In, uh, Mor uh, Morris, uh, that that would be, um, that would become his or her residence and under, under the ruling you're, you're describing and that would um, make the, the 
community responsible for the educational expenses of that children simply by virtue of being placed in this transitional residence. Is that We'll logistic? put a finer, finer point on it. Actually, um, the, the ALJ decision was that uh, you know, traditionally and historically, yeah. the, this, you know, if, if, if a child was from Bergen County, a community in Bergen County, yeah. and was sent to Morris Plains, the community in Bergen County would be responsible for the education costs mm -hmm. into the future. Uh, the ALJ decision was uh, the Bergen County community would now be responsible for one year of the residents uh, of the of the now the Morris Plains facilities resident uh, yeah. education. After the one year, the the child would become the responsibility of the host Just community. Actually, so for yeah. it, was a, it was a one year delay, but essentially what what you've described is is yeah. the uh, is the case. Well. Uh, so my first reaction to it, and I look forward to learning more in conversation uh, with you, is that anything that creates an, it's a disincentive for communities to accept children into, into transitional facilities in them sounds like bad public policy to me. So uh, I don't know whether this decision is under review or whether it's a faithful application of a law. Uh, that needs to be amended. It's something I'll need to learn more about, and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. We appreciate that, Commissioner. No, it's. Um, uh, I believe the ALJ decision has worked its way through the, the mm -hmm. administrative law process. And again, these are children who are coming from all over the state, and some out of state, mm -hmm. uh, to be placed in places that are um, safe and hospitable to them. And we have no problem having them. You know, my kids don't even know who the kids are. In these, sure. They're just students in the school. And that's the way it should be. Um, but if, we, if it's a, serving a, you know, a statewide public policy purpose to have them in our communities, uh, Perhaps the, the, the cost should be borne uh, statewide as opposed to locally. If we can work on that, that would be wonderful. Thank you, I'd, Commissioner. I'd, I'd be delighted to do that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Assemblyman Wimberly. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Still battling a little laryngitis oh, here. Oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner, um, obviously we met shortly before, and hopefully we get to meet each other a little more in depth uh, in the near future, obviously with the uh, many problems that the Patterson uh, School District is facing and some other, uh, uh, you know, uh, Garfield is another district that's had some problems in our, in our district. Um, <clears throat> gosh, I'm struggling with this one. You know, you talked about the at-risk, uh, you know, uh, concerns, and, you know, each of my colleagues, uh, many of them have touched on it. Um, I, I'm just curious, what are some of the alternative ways um, that you're going to define at-risk uh, students? So uh, that's uh, exactly the enterprise that this, this task force is to embark on, and, and the, the absolute simple answer to your very good question is we don't know. I mean, we, are, we want to look at how other states have done it. Um, and you know, one is entitled to be someone. Just give me something. I, I mean, if you have this task well, force, well, the one, uh, I, I'm sure there's had to be some discussion or there, some some place to Has has been uh, has not even convened yet. I mean, so it's re it's really very early on in the process. The governor just announced his um, his nominees, and uh, Rochelle Hendricks. I don't know if you know her, but she's head of higher education. Um, uh, was asked to be the chairperson, and she, um, you know, Dave Hespe of of our team is. Um, is going to be sort of uh, supporting the work uh, as well, but uh, you know there are um, you know I could give you I could give you some ideas that sort of come out of my head. Th that will help because uh, I'm uh, curious because obviously sure. it's going to have a major um, impact. So the the, uh, the the idea that I find from a policy point of view most intriguing is to fund on the basis of academic performance and not fund on the basis of poverty. So just to just do a hypothetical example. Um, um, so if you're, there's a district um, and 100 percent of the kids are advanced proficient, um, we wouldn't really focus on whether or not you know they were you know the economic circumstances of their um, of, of their home life. We'd say whatever whatever it is, you know the, you know this district is getting it done. Uh, now if you have another district and 40 percent of the kids can't read or whatever measure we sign we we, we assign to it, we say. We got to invest like crazy in the future of these kids because they're headed for a path that is, you know, a very scary one. Um, and so that we should allocate more resources to the district based on the number of children who are, are you know, not getting it done uh, academically. Now, again, that is just one one way uh, of doing it, and it may not even be a sensible way of doing it. But that is one way that um, I think is worthy of 
worthy of exploration. I mean, other ways that other experts, and I don't pretend to be one, have talked about is doing it through, uh, you know, one of your colleagues uh, talked about the possibility of doing it through, um, you know, the, the, tax, the tax, <laughs> tax returns or food stamps. I mean, there are, there are a lot of other proxies, but, the, but in the end, what this is supposed to be about is not supposed to be about poverty. It's supposed to be about making sure that all kids um, are, you know, getting to the finish line uh, uh, educationally. And, and that's the bottom. I mean, I, yeah. the, the good thing I've heard today is I think your your expected outcome or, you know, what, what your legacy will be in the long term is, uh, you know, the children who normally, uh, you know, are, are consistently feel that, you know, you want to make sure they're there and all the other mitigating factors that you, you deal with. And obviously you're familiar with the Pattersons and the Norks and places that there are so many factors that uh, you can't put in a formula. And, and you touched on one thing, and, and I was a classroom teacher for nine years, is that, uh, you know, when, when the kid comes to school and the breakfast consisted of a, a honey bun and a, a, a RC cola, you know, I mean, it's just not good. Or if that student slept for, you know, maybe three hours that night because their home has a two-bedroom with nine people. These are all things that can never be put into a, a formula. Right. But these are realistic things. I mean, uh, um, Assemblyman uh, um, Johnson hit on the fact that, you know, the, the amount of incarcerated parents that we have in our district uh, with sixth grade educations, right. um, all of these things that are, are not going to factor into any of these formulas at all have to be taken into consideration at some point through that committee. Mm -hmm. And and people who are not so much, I'm talking about an academic and the, the real life situations that, you know, people deal with them on day in and day out. So, I mean, I was glad to hear that from you and that these things hopefully will be taken in consideration when you look at, you know, schools and particularly on the state takeover like the city of Patterson. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> under um, the uh, you know the numbers have been talked about a lot about as far as the uh, um, the changes in um, school aid funding and um, obviously it, it's not good for the city of Patterson. The the amount of money that could be lost. Can you just elaborate on that? Sure. In fact, I can I, I can um, get very explicit about that. If you'll give me one second. Uh, am I in the wrong? Ah, great, thank you. So um, Patterson is, a, is a, a, a very interesting case. It's basically um, between 12, FY12, uh, that's the fiscal year that's about to end, and the proposal for FY13. Um, it's proposed on the K-12, we'll leave uh, pre-K out for a moment, to um, receive $397 million, actually $398 million in um, in aid, and that's essentially flat. It's down two tenths of one percent um, year on year. Um, so, um, the, uh, you know, it, it is a district um, that is, uh, you know, uh, I, I suspect we might agree, um, uh, faced, uh, you know, tremendous challenges. There are many, many children there who are not uh, getting the education that you and I would both aspire to, uh, that they have. Its building stock is very old. Um, and I've had the opportunity to tour those buildings, as I know my colleague, uh, uh, Director Larkins, has uh, as, as well. Uh, I have been pleased uh, with um, Dr. Evans' um, um, thinking and work over the, la over the last year, and I've seen um, a very creative plan um, develop that he is now committed to um, uh, implementing. You know, as you, I, I think you know, I. Well, you may not know, I, I've had a chance to go visit with that board on a couple of occasions. Yes. And um, I think we may have met there. Yes. Uh, yes. But uh, in any event, um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, it's a very engaged and very active board with some very sort of strong and powerful uh, and smart people uh, who, who are involved. And yet the whole uh, environment is, you know, extremely charged and complicated. Um, but I'm, I'm, I am feeling forward progress happening in Patterson. Um, well, well, that moves on to the next thing. I, I understand the numbers point. Obviously, you understand we can't afford to lose any type of funding. But um, on, on, on that end, uh, more or less uh, the uh, uh, progress of our state district superintendent, uh, Dr. Evans, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're happy with the progress. Um, because one of my concerns, not only as a, uh, uh, a legislator for the district, but a father of three children in the district, is uh, the, the turnover ratio 
of uh, state district superintendents. I think we've had four with one serving twice as an intern. And this is a major concern of many uh, residents in the uh, city of Patterson that, you know, another philosophy just at this point now that the timing is, is not good. I mean, we, we know that, uh, you know, his hand is, is being something that's been dealt under 18 years of previous state takeover. Right. Uh, uh, you know, um, consequences that he's facing and nothing that anybody could clean up in three years. Um, I, I just hope that through the auditing and all that, whatever assistance he needs, that, um, yeah. that you will continue to work with him and know that, you know, many of us in our community do support him and believe that, you know, his vision is good with, uh, you know, input, like you said, from that um, advisory board on that, uh, at the Board of Education. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, the um, Next question I have is uh, in reference to uh, uh, another thing that came up today was about vocational training, and uh, uh, something Catino hit on it. Um, Patterson is in a rare situation. What's happened is uh, I think Passaic County Technical Institute at one point was, and I'm a graduate of it, was Passaic County Technical uh, Vocational School. It has gone away now to an elite system of education, as I call it, because they've gone to an institute, meaning that they more or less come in and um, they cherry pick the best students out of the city of Patterson and Passaic County. They bring them there. It's no longer the traditional plumbing, uh, automotive, carpentry things that could probably save some of our kids. And in many instances, as uh, some of Catino said, motivate them to probably move on to higher education. Uh, uh, because of the success that they're experiencing at uh, something that they're doing. Um, if it isn't a plan, I hope there's a future plan outside of the uh, academies yeah. for a true vocational school that probably could save uh, that 50% dropout rate of black and Hispanic boys in the city of Patterson. That, that true traditional uh, automotive shop, that true plumbing, plumbing and uh, uh, carpentry, electrician apprentice opportunities, these are not uh, pie in the sky things. These are things that worked. They worked so well at Bissette County Tech that they moved away from them. And as you know, I'm sure even though it's a county-run school, it's an unbelievable facility there. Um, uh, one of the reasons I think our numbers hurt so bad academically is, and attendance-wise, is because our best kids, and particularly in the high school area, go to Passaic County Tech. I mean, that, that, that's the reality of the thing. It, it is the reality, and you're absolutely right. One, you know, one of the, the little secrets, you know, when, particularly when people are, uh, you know, focus on charter schools, which is, you know, are required to take, take all comers and have a lottery if you don't, is that, um, we have one of the best voc ed systems in the nation, in my judgment, the, 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 the county voc ed system, but they are screened schools. They are elite schools, and um, so very often, um, you know, they take, you know, if you forgive the phrase, the best and the brightest from the, from the community, and uh, I could not agree more that providing career path, a career path education um, outside of the context of, of those you know, frankly, very um, elite schools is a is a very important policy to pursue. And um, I'm glad you agree on that. Um, but in, in which leads right into charter schools. Um, obviously, a major concern with many of the board members, uh, in particular, is that I guess the uh, uh, quote unquote rumor that schools will be closing down in the city of Patterson and we'll be will be leasing um, public school facilities to charter schools. Um, charter schools have had some. Um, uh, plus and negatives in the city of Patterson, um, and you're familiar with, you know, two field charter schools. But as of recently, I'm I'm very pleased with the visits and um, mm -hmm. the conversation and the numbers that um, the uh, Patterson Charter School for Science and Technology has shown. Um, in, in turn, I just think it, it needs to be, you know, really, uh, um, you know, work with the board in this particular situation because I I mean I'm in total agreement. If we're feeling I'm willing to try anything. I don't care if it's the scholarship back or whatever it is. We have to try something outside of the box to make our kids successful. But uh, under this particular circumstance, I hope there is, I'm not sure if it's a rumor, I'm not sure you know what it is, but are there plans to close schools in the city of Patterson and, and um, lease out to charter schools? Well, first of all, this would be a decision that, uh, that uh, Dr. Evans uh, would make, and I'm sure, knowing Dr. Evans, that he would consult, uh, would consult with a board. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that is the case. I believe that he is uh, sort of starting to talk about the idea of closing some schools, um, and uh, that is whether through consolidation or, or because of because of um, you know academic academic performance. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think that's connected with a charter school plan. But I'm not I, I'm I'm not I'm certainly not aware of it. Is I will tell you that philosophically. 
I share your view that the only thing we as adults should be caring about is whether you know, children have an option, a public school option that works for them, and whether it's a charter school or a traditional public school is something that um, you know, the, I don't think that we should focus on that, uh, that much. But the specific answer to your question is I don't, I'm not aware of any plan of that nature. Through the chair, if possible, if there is something down the line, could you please forward it to the chair and keep me abreast of what's going on? Because, like you said, innuendos and rumors are, you know, just yeah. just that, you know. But You're, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to do that. But let me let me let me commit to doing this. I will uh, speak to, uh, to Dr. Evans and ask him to be directly in touch with you. Because again, this would be this would be his plan. But I, will, I mean, I'm happy to stay in close communication with you about this. Thank you. I have no problem with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Larkin, Director Larkin, uh, we had a brief meeting here uh, at the break, but uh, you know, according to reports from the DOE and SDA, Patterson facility needs are the greatest among districts in New Jersey. Uh, bottom line is, and, and we said it briefly over here, is when can we get help? I mean, uh, you're familiar, you've, you've toured with Commissioner Surf. I mean, uh, our buildings, and I, I'm not even sure if they took you to the worst. If you saw school number 16, you've seen the worst probably. If you seen school number, seen school number 14, but it's in between. Uh, the, the problems in the winter time with uh, no heat in buildings still. In the summertime, you can't lift windows up and it's, it's extremely hot. I shared your experience that my son attends one of the schools who has nosebleeds. Every time it's hot, his nose bleeds. Um, things of these natures are just not conducive with learning, which obviously can have an effect on some of these formulas and concern with attendance. If I have to go to a school that's freezing and I have to wear a coat, do I go to school? In the summertime, if we decide, if we get a 90 degree heat wave in May, what is our attendance rate then? And these, these are some of the factors that you could never find in these formulas. But I mean, what is the plan overall for the city of Patterson at all aspect? And, and like you said, you weren't familiar with the last, uh, um, re, uh, uh, thing that came out that I saw in reference to Patterson not even being on a list for some of the uh, you know, work that's to be done. Sure, that, that actually is a, a fantastic question, Assemblyman. What I will tell you is historically, this, this program has sent the third largest amount of money to Patterson for their school facility needs. Um, they, they rank right above Jersey City in terms of level of funding so far through the program. The problem has been Historically, there was not a strategic review and conversation with the districts to uh, come up with a holistic solution um, to advance work in a way that would ultimately lead to long-term uh, facility improvement. What, what historically was happening is we would just receive requests from the district and advance them um, uh, on a one-off basis. There was never a real strategic plan that involved us. Now, in fairness to the district, the districts do develop long-range facilities plans, mm -hmm. but they do that on their own, and it doesn't, it's not realistic in terms of levels of funding. So when this program started, there was an, an expectation that maybe the state could do everything. But I think now uh, there's more of a realistic um, uh, understanding that there is a limited pool of funding. So what we've been doing is working with the district to develop a strategic plan. We've been in close conversations with Dr. Evans, with Chris Sapara Grant, and others um, in Patterson. Right now, what we have slated for replacement schools for, for Patterson um, are the Marshall Street Elementary School, um, which was a problem project, yet another problem project that we inherited um, that we're looking to get restarted uh, in the fall of this year. Uh, we also just recently advertised for the demolition of the property where the replacement uh, 16 school will go. So hopefully in the next few months that activity will start up. We'll get the old school down. We'll get uh, some of those uh, uh, residences and other things in the area down to clear way for a new school. Also, the announcement this year anticipated yet a third school that we would be able to deliver up in Patterson and the fourth one that's out there that we have to uh, conclude conversations with is about uh, Don Bosco, because that's a, that's a facility that, that we presently own, that the district is occupying, but there's also some conversations about potentially doing something with that long term. So right now we have those four projects in the works. Um, there are other emergent projects that, that we can talk more specifically about. Um, where we've been doing a rehabilitation. There are a number of schools where we've been working on roofs, windows, things, things like that. 
Um, but what I will say is ultimately our goal is to try to stretch the money that we have as far as we can, not only for Patterson, but for all of the other districts. But what that really requires is a conversation with the district to make sure that we're sequencing the work in the right way. Okay, and, and, you, and you mentioned the uh, LRFP, and um, ha have we identified funding for these schools? Well, <laughs> at the time when most of these LRFPs were, I would say, um, finalized and submitted to DOE, I don't know that there was real consideration given to the amount of funding out there. So there's certainly no expectation that we have a level of funding to, <laughs> to meet what's set out in, in all of the district's long-range facilities plan. It's not even close. Um, but I think what we have been doing is looking at that plan strategically with the funding that we have to advance the work in a way that makes sense for the district. Because the other issue when we're advancing this work is making sure that the districts have swing space so that they can move the kids in a way that makes sense until new facilities are, uh, are opened or come online. So we are working with them closely. We're looking at the LRFP. I, I suspect in the short term, a lot of districts are going to be amending their, their LRFP um, to, to, to really take into more or greater consideration the levels of funding that exist right now, but we are working closely with them on it. Okay, and with 14 schools over 100 years old, I mean, hopefully there is something done with Don Bosco. I mean, I was disappointed when the uh, Patterson Catholic space was uh, scooped up by a charter school, which would have been a great swing space for the uh, uh, you know school district and obviously made a lot of sense in a great neighborhood for many of our kids, and particularly the high school age kids, to attend the school there. Uh, um, the, the last thing is occurring, uh, through the chair, if it's okay, is my concern with International High School sure. and the ongoing issue with the uh, um, occupancy uh, situation where we're paying, uh, paid up to almost $210,000 now over seven years. Sure. There, there has to be some resolution to this. Sure. It makes no sense at all that every time you have to have an a, a event or something that we have to have a fire marshal on board. Uh, I mean, the long-term plan, I mean, it just, it just doesn't make sense. Sure. It, it really doesn't. And I've heard it over and over again. And I keep saying, is it done yet? Is it done yet? And it hasn't been done yet. Um, and, and you're talking about being thrifty and financially, you know, uh, uh, doing the right things for the district. I mean, something has to be done with that right away. It's a beautiful facility. And I think that's the, the one black eye that that facility has. Now, hopefully it's something that you can address. It, it absolutely is something that we address. It's another embarrassing situation uh, that we inherited when we, when we came aboard in this program. It's another issue related to the atrium. Um, we've spent, as you said, hundreds of thousands of dollars on fire watches. So um, where we are right now is we have DCA release on the fix to the atrium. Uh, we just have to get a contractor on board, and we're hoping to get that done before the end of this year. So hopefully uh, by the end of this year that, that will be resolved. At the same time, there were other minor uh, repair things that, that, that needed to be taken care of, um, which we've advanced. So I think by the end of this year, we'll be in a good place with Patterson International. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Surf and Director, I greatly appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to working with you closely in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you, Assemblyman. <laughs> Commissioner, if I, if I may ask um, that it came to mind, last year for the uh, New Jersey after three, uh, the governor had made mention that potentially uh, um, would be able to get contributions that would be given to these providers uh, to help out for the New Jersey after three. Was that something that went through the department? Can you talk about that or are you aware of it? Well, here's, here, here's what I can say. I know that, uh, that uh, New Jersey after three um, is uh, a program that was the subject of, of, uh, of uh, a recent statement by uh, by the governor, um, and essentially the gist of that statement was um, uh, that you know he was eager to look for a way to um, mm -hmm. to allow for the continuation of um, of the program. He sort of you know asked me to give some thought to that, and um, my team and I have have done that. Um, and the, you know this is premised, however on finding not only an appropriate function for the program, but also finding private funds uh, for the right. program. So uh, have any been found um, I, to this um, point? Um, I believe the answer is maybe, uh, maybe. not to be, not to be, uh, <laughs> not to be uh, indirect. I mean, I know that there have been, uh, there's been a philanthropist identified and he has indicated a preliminary interest in supporting it, but I don't think the deal is closed. Okay, so would that be something that would go directly to the providers or would it be a function that it would go through this your department? Is the, 
The, well, I don't think we'd ever see the money. I hope we never see the money. I think it would probably go directly, uh, directly uh, to um, the provider. I mean, I haven't thought about the structure, right. but the, um, but the function that NJ After Three would serve mm -hmm. would be something that we would be involved in designing. Okay. Th thank you. Thank uh, you, Assemblyman Chair. I believe you had a follow-up question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a brief question. I don't suspect to long of an answer. Opportunity Scholarship Act. Um, you had mentioned just a few moments ago, I believe in discussion with Assemblyman Wimberley, um, the constellation of educational offerings and you mentioned uh, charter and you mentioned public. Where do you see parochial, where do you see private um, in that constellation? So uh, I believe in choice. Um, I believe that giving parents um, the opportunity to choose from a broad array of educational options that fit their child's needs um, is a driver of quality for all schools. Um, and I believe that the spectrum of uh, options includes everything you just list. It includes non-publics. It includes uh, what, uh, what would come out of, uh, you know, fingers crossed, the OSA. It includes charters. It includes uh, vocational schools. It includes magnet schools. It includes traditional public schools. As I say, one of the, um, I think, saddest parts of the education debate that has taken place in this country and in this state is that an enormous amount of energy is spent on um, what I think of as adult issues as opposed to on, on child-centered issues. And I think if we really focus on children and parents, um, all we're interested in is, is the school successful and fair and equitable in terms of access. Um, and everything else is, is an issue that bears no relationship to the best interest of the child. The latest iteration, I believe, in the Assembly and in the Senate is that the uh, bill is presently constructed with the price tag is around $136 million. Um, and just doing some quick math in terms of a education. Can I just ask for clarification? You're talking about OSA, sir? OSA, right. Yes, yes. And given the commitment of the state, uh, at least in terms of the governor's proposed budget of the $7.8 billion for education, that comes out to 1.74% of the budget, um, which hardly would seem like anything to be um, right. So total. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. Assemblywoman Watson Coleman had a follow up question. I do, Commissioner. And this is regarding our Trenton school that we were talking about. Is it possible that your department had a communication with the Diocese of Trenton about the closing of the Emily Fisher School before Emily Fisher School got an opportunity to make all of its uh, sort of pleas before you or its uh, due process? I'm not aware of anything like that. I think the only call I'm aware of is that I asked my staff to call the superintendent of schools in Trenton um, to, uh, to ask them you know, about the realism of absorbing some of these children mm -hmm. back into the traditional system. But if there's, uh, I, I'm not aware of anything. Is anyone aware of anything? Do no. you? Yeah or any member of you know, your leadership staff here have uh, any idea if that building is going to be used by either the traditional Trenton School District or because it is a charter school building technically right. and the building will get used for something. So do you have any idea? Is there another charter school coming in there? Is there a I'm, I'm not aware of either another charter school or any future use. I just don't know. Uh, I've, I've just not heard of anything. If you have the... Discussed. Yeah. I'm I, sorry. I said we don't even know it's been discussed what the use of the building would be. I haven't heard a discussion on that at all. Yeah, okay. Um, one, last, one last thing that I was reminded of, and I thank you for sending me over the diversity information, but it basically I think it said that there were 32 people that you consider and your, um, and that's not including Mr. Larkins, I, I know. 32 people that you were considering in your senior staff, that's your assistant commissioners, the, the directors, the academic officers, Correct. the innovation officer, da, da. and of those, um, um, one eighth are minority and one fourth are women, is that? 
I be, I, uh, I'm going to look it up as we okay. speak, but yeah. I believe it's one-eighth, your math is better than mine, is 12.5%, right? That's one-eighth. Um, um, our minorities and uh, of the 32, this is, as you say, director level. Um, well, that's what you're reporting. That's your, yes. that's yes. your yeah. That's correct. Yeah. I will also tell you that I have uh, extended offers uh, to two very senior, um, and if, if I may close on an editorial point, um, that um, – I have extended offers to uh, several um, uh, minority um, candidates to very senior positions, and it is extremely difficult um, to recruit that kind of talent um, to the Department of Education because our pay scale is lower than in districts, mm -hmm. and, and it's statutorily limited. And I don't know about you all in your work, but when you're trying to recruit talent to your organization, if you start not being able to um, meet, meet competitive rates, it's a very complicated, and, and these individuals are in immense demand because they're extremely talented people. Yeah, and that, that's, that's very interesting for you to say that yeah. because, I mean, there's high unemployment, yeah. big challenge in the economy. They yeah. say that, you know, lawyers, doctors, Indian yeah. chiefs, and PhDs yeah. are underemployed and unemployed. You got Mr. Hespy here, you know, <laughs> so I don't know what we're saying about him. <laughs> Just teasing Dave. Um, so that, that's kind of interesting that you would say that because I would think that you would have greater opportunities to recruit people who would otherwise be employed, right. but because of New Jersey's economy there, in particular. There um, are um, very, uh, there are a lot of people in education. Mm -hmm. There are very few um, uh, individuals who are, cap who are you know, equipped to think in a different, creative, and aggressive way about change, um, mm. and um, and it's a it's a it's a far more limited pool than you than you would imagine, and it's very it's you know this is a I I, I admit that um, I have had um, I could not possibly be more pleased by uh, the our ability to attract people through that problem, but it is it is. Um, I, I can just tell you as a factual matter mm -hmm. that uh, just because you introduced mm -hmm. the discussion by asking about mm -hmm. uh, minority um, candidates in the, on the leadership team, that um, mm -hmm. there are two very talented individuals who took a job um, in the public sector paying uh, about $50,000 more than I can pay. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Commissioner. It's been a long day. I want to thank you for all the information. This is very helpful to us as we move forward in the budget process, and we look forward to seeing some of these schools built and education. Like I said, it's a, so, such an important thing for, for the state of New Jersey. Thank you again.